I'm going to kind of talk through what I think of as the core defense of topicality from a variety of criticisms about limiting the topic. Okay, like that's our, our core feature here is to try and find a philosophical justification or a political justification for debating a limited topic, right? That's the strategic role of topicality, kind of limit the, what the ground, the affirmative can start with, okay? I'm gonna guess, and, and we'll sort of talk through some of the arguments that you all have heard on this, but you've, you're part of contemporary debate, so you've seen a, a, a number of different affirmatives that argue that we should not start from the premise of a limited topic, right? How many of you have had a debate versus a, an affirmative that does not read a plan, that criticizes the basis of the topic rather than affirming some portion of that topic? Raise your hand. Okay, some, not all. Yes, or almost everybody. Okay. Um, in thinking about the basis for those criticisms versus kind of like how we're gonna to defend topicality, I'm gonna to say that we're gonna defend topicality on the basis of fairness, okay? That is, it's a procedure or fair competition. Okay, fairness is a kind of, you know, very conventional or classical key impact argument, right? In order to compete in a debate, we need the grounds for competition to be reasonably fair, okay? There are also, because of the way in which fairness has been used as a concept in our society, many criticisms of the kind of very basis of the like competitive ground or the fair uh, set of procedures that we're trying to establish. That's where a lot of the affirmative kind of criticisms of a vision of a limited topic come from, right? Can anybody generate some ideas or, you know, maybe arguments that you've debated before on, you know, let's think about what the criticism of this idea might look like. So where do we hear criticisms of fairness? Debate culturally is not fair. Okay, so. What do you hear about that? I'm going to call that debate can't be fair. Okay. And I will go ahead and use your language of structural unfairness, but I will modify that slightly more. Okay. Where what's the what are the what's the reason for can't be fair? Like it's exclusionary for uh favor of color for greater raise the limit or something. Like about injustices of our society equal unjust debate. I will go ahead and say here that the students of color, heteronormativity, patriarchy, gender discrimination, I'm going to say that those are those are some of the examples that you presented, right? That these are questions sometimes of the degree of access, sometimes of the degree of resources, right? That I'm going to say that those are injustices in our present society that mean that we can't have a fair debate. Yeah, is that a fair summary? Okay. Plus, it's the benefits. I mean, I guess that seems like a bad thing. It's like at some point, like, and do we have like fair and convincing? Like, excuse me. Resource disparity, we might also think of this as a form of class difference or exploitation, right? So it's clearly a related argument, even if not exactly the same. Okay. Other arguments that you've heard about this? Well, trying to impose an idea of like what fairness looks like in debate is like, I guess, like policing or like alternative in okay. terms of what debate can look like. Limitation is a form of policing. I would also kind of use the language of like boundary or border enforcement, potentially. Use a term that used to be very obscure and is now just part of online culture, right? Gatekeeping, okay. Right, the notion that 
limitation is intended to impose res restrictions on access so as to make sure that there are a certain set of ideas or concepts that do not appear in debate, right, or that do not appear as debatable. Yeah. Other arguments. Yeah. I mean, I guess in some people's argue like it just like doesn't matter because like you have like open different spaces for like people to like not engage as much as like the you know. That is, procedural fairness cannot outweigh injustice to a member of the debate community, is the way I'm going to summarize that. But do you, do you agree with that as kind of yeah. a, a label for that argument? Okay. Anything else we need to put on this list? Yeah. It's, like, it's not right to impact the person who's there. Aha. So, fairness is not an impact in and of itself. We only have fairness to learn. That is, the primary goal of debate is educational. You should learn more things. Limiting exactly what we learn means that you don't do that. So we're undermining the goals of debate by trying to procedurally limit it. Is that a fair summary? Anything else that I need to put on this list? Okay, we'll see if we kind of add some things as we're talking through them. Okay. Also, go with a clean board over here. Okay. One of the differences between, if you if you notice the word that I put up here, procedure. Okay. In thinking about most of these arguments, can we see that they're focused on particular outcomes or results? You see what I'm, Layla, what do you, what do you, you're nodding your head. So like explain why you think that this is kind of outcome based. We were just talking about like at the end of like all our debates, like what has to be done, how does it, and then like sometimes I'll see like debates about how like it can't be fair, or like about how like cultural norms don't matter to debaters, like they can like exclude people like these people from like participating as debaters. It's like the result of that debate is that a space is like opened up for like debaters for like this type of education at the end of the, the debate has been made possible. Yeah, right. Like I think I think that's a pretty good summary from Layla that in most of these circumstances, all of these arguments depend to some degree on the way in which they're connected to a particular outcome in a debate, right? That could be who is participating in the debate, the terms on which we're participating, right? The result in terms of the education that we receive, like what did we learn in the debate? What did we hear about? Okay. Even the things that function as inputs here, right? Like that, I thought that might be one of the objections is like all these coaching resource arguments or exclusion arguments about our educational system, right? Those are inputs, not outputs, but they're still, they are results based in the sense that this is, if you think of this as the accumulation of results over time, right? It's like, an argument about heteronormativity, about the way in which our uh, educational system is influenced by racism or by patriarchy, right? Heteronormativity, those are compiled outcomes, right? It's just like the results of the educational processes in our society have consolidated particular advantages, okay? That's why, well, sorry, one more step here, okay? What's wrong with these? features of debate slash the way in which debate manifests some of the injustices of our society. What, what's, what's your objection to these things? And I, I don't mean this like totally facetiously. I'm not asking you to like to imagine that I envisioned that exclusion of students of color or heteronormativity in our society is like, ugh, I mean, what's wrong with that? I'm not saying it that way. I'm asking you to explain to me, I think most of us, probably agree or are starting from the premise that we don't want these things to be a feature of, our, of the way in which we debate. Yeah. So why not? Bias. Bias. Okay. So one way that we could say that this is you know, wrong is that it introduces some fundamental aspects of prejudice, bias, misunderstanding, right? The like only some perspectives get, get heard, only some people get to speak, right? that that's fundamentally a, a relationship in which we're not going to hear kind of 
the full picture or get the full set of speakers and full set of trees. Agreed? Okay. And this also is the argument why it's like you're flooding, like things that are like true that like you can't refute necessarily. So like there has to be some sort of like living. Actually, Let, let's let's pause for a moment on answering a couple of the arguments. And I'm just I just want you to kind of and I, you're you're skipping a step. You're you're on top of it. I got it. But let's think for a moment about just like what what do we think is wrong about these things? So like bias is one of them. Go ahead, Dora. Oh, um, the way that uh, we think about the way that we think about bees and the base and the flex in like everyday life and in society and in real policy making. Why why is it bad to have a society that's heteronormative? Uh, well, because it's exclusive, right? Like, like you think it's exclusionary, or you know, the norm that is established is establishing a form of exclusion. Okay, so what does that imply is good? If that's what's bad, what's good? Uh, good is that we don't exclude, and therefore there's less violence. And... Okay, so we opt for a strategy of inclusion. There are some criticisms of inclusion as well, but we'll we'll take it for a moment that that's kind of one of the things that's built in. Notice that's related to this bias issue, right? Of like including more perspectives is potentially a way of limiting or uh, even eliminating bias, right? Because we hear more. Sid? Like saying that it's closer to the system. Like you, you want like a society that's like fair. Yeah, like I, I think one of the, what I was trying to get at here is that I think many of you, you know, it's also like, I understand <laughs> I'm asking you to defend some things that maybe you just kind of think of as like they're intuitive. That could be the case, I, I hope so. It, it might be that you could phrase it as these are intuitively situations that are, they're unjust because they are unfair, right? That the outcomes that are available to people in our society are, you know, they are differentiated on the basis of things that are unfair to build in any differences, right? That it's like racism, discrimination based on race is unfair. There is an account of racism that says that part of what is wrong is that it is, un, it is fundamentally unfair or unjust, right? Justice is, in this case, the like, giving each their due. It's unfair to take or, and to hoard opportunities on the part of um, people who are white. That's an account that you could give of why it is that racism is unjust or unfair, okay? If we're talking about fairness over here and fairness over here, that this is a set of things that are unfair, are they the same? Why not? Okay, is is having a debate in which one side has a significant advantage over the other also unfair? Mm -hmm. So, like, what's what's different then, or is there a difference between these ways of thinking about what's unfair? Okay, Sid. Okay, you use the language of structural. I'm going to use the language of substance. That this is a substantive account of injustice. That is, it's outcome based. The substance, what occurs or what the outcome is, is unfair. Here, when we're talking about the procedure, okay, talking about the rules that govern what is occurring not the set of outcomes that we have, okay? That's what I'm trying to get at here is the like, we're dealing with some phenomenon that could all be characterized as issues of unfairness or of injustice, okay? But the categories that we use to describe these different violations are oftentimes different, okay? The set of people who are interested in procedural fairness, right, are tend to be discussing the ways in which, like, how do we conduct ourselves? This might be a set of arguments based on what type of outcomes does our conduct create? Substantive unfairness or substantive injustice. That is of substance instead of how we got there. Okay. What do you think that some of the people who say that we really want substantive justice or you know to limit substantive injustice or unfairness in our society have to say about procedural fairness? You think that they're just like on board for procedural fairness? They're one and the same? 
Anybody heard any criticisms of procedural fairness? What is procedural fairness? Okay, well, let's think about where the language of procedure shows up in our society, like in our approaches to either competition or to other processes, is process focused. So like anybody know an important area where process shows up in thinking about fairness? Maybe in the constitution? Right, so like that definitely fits with this kind of substantive unfairness, right? Yeah. Due process of law, right? That's an example of the protection of procedure, right? The idea that everybody has to face the same procedures and there are procedural constraints on what can be done that have to be, you have to meet those burdens of providing due process of law before you can do any of the things in our justice system that are required to put people in jail, arrest them, et cetera, that those are, there are procedural limitations on what can happen, okay? That is kind of what I was thinking there is like that set of procedural protections, due process of law, okay. What do you think some of the people who have this set of criticisms of our society have to say about due process of law? Why not? Right? This set of criticisms could just as easily be made about the way in which the concept of procedure shows up in a bunch of the other aspects of our, our society that are not related to debate, right? That are related to this concept of like due process of law, right? So like, if you think about this as a set of arguments about, well, the DA who's the prosecutor in, in the court has the support of the state. They have a very high conviction rate. They like generally are advantaged in courtroom procedure, right? Where if you've got a public defender whose caseload is like 500 cases and they don't have a lot of time to deal with your case, that's a significant resource disparity that like, even though technically you both received legal representation, right? Your procedural rights were protected. You received a court attorney, okay? But substantively, we might say that it's like, well, but that's not actually a fair procedure or a fair process. We know that it's kind of, the outcomes are gonna be unfair. It's a rigged game, right? Just like the, the outcomes are gonna be unfair, even though technically we're following the same procedures. The law and its majestic equality forbids rich and poor alike from sleeping under bridges and stealing loaves of bread. Anatole France, great quote, love it, right? The procedural fairness in this case, many of these criticisms are that procedural fairness is actually in part responsible for substantively unfair outcomes because we create nice, you know, pretty words and ideological justifications for procedural fairness in order to hide the fact that we've got these really unjust, ugly outcomes. Okay. It's like that that's part of the way in which we cover up for our society's unfairness. Notice where some of these, you know, Debate has drawn from criticisms of policing, order enforcement, right? Like the operations of our legal institutions and in particular law enforcement, okay? Because topicality has a legal backdrop. <laughs> How many of you have ever heard topicality described as a voting issue for reasons of jurisdiction? This is pretty old. You probably don't hear jurisdiction anymore. I bet Jake and her jurisdiction. Do you mean like Meg Brown? No, I do not. <laughs> I, I, sorry, I don't mean to, I'm not laughing at you. It's just like, this is very old school language. This is like, you know, from a few decades ago in debate, jurisdiction as in like the judge, okay, another, another legal term, right? We are engaging in judgment, just like this set of legal analogies is kind of all over debate, okay? So that's part of the reason that this set of criticisms draws on these concepts as a way of saying, you know, the attempt to produce procedurally fair debate is actually responsible for some of these substantively unfair outcomes. Yeah? Okay. So I wanted to kind of get us on the same page about what I think of as, it's like, there's a reason that this set of criticisms has been successful. It's a very powerful criticism of a number of the institutions in our society, just like, 
I think there are, there, there are good cards. There's good evidence to suggest that this relationship is one where it's like we ideologically hold on to procedure as a way of pr protecting ourselves from understanding that our society is unjust. Okay, so responding to this set of criticisms requires a few things. One, you want to break the analogy to the operations of these law enforcement institutions, okay? You must make some arguments that T is not the same as the police. That may seem obvious. At the same time, I rarely see people do this. How many of you have spent time in any of the debates that you've had trying to go through this argument thoroughly? Layla's got to like, yeah, that's maybe. It's like in our blocks, but it's not necessarily. <laughs> it's in our block. In our blocks is the phrase, T is not like the police, but I'm not so certain about it. Anybody want to give me some of the ways in which you think you might justify the like, no, these are not analogous? Like, like sometimes you say it's like, it kind of like washes over with the actual environment, like comparing like two high schools of videos, like, who are like trying to like differentiate or have a debate about the multiple things that they kind of like trivializes like actual violence carried out by police. I, I think that one of the, like that, I understand that possibility, right? That it's just like, hey, you know, these high school debaters, they're not officers with badges and guns. And like, so the stakes are lower. Yeah. I think that there is some, we'll, we'll kind of get to that. Lowering the stakes is something that we'll talk, I'm putting that as a reminder to myself. Okay. One of the things that I think I'm not going to start there in making this kind of break the analogy argument is that I think it runs afoul of, it's like, it doesn't necessarily break the analogy. It says, well, you know, if we drew the analogy, like we're just not as bad. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it lowers some of the possible impact, but if you can win that some of this is about kind of the same ideological commitment, right? That like, hey, yeah, we aren't saying you're literally the police, but we are saying that you're engaging in similar activities, then that argument only sort of helps us, right? I, I, it's not a bad argument, but it's not the place that I'd start. What else? Any other, any other ideas? Or are we stuck on, like, if, let me put it this way. If this argument, if we can't make this argument at all, <laughs> you know, convincing, we're in trouble, right? <laughs> like, if the analogy holds, most of the rest of what we're going to say, I don't love our chances. Is, wait, when you say topicality, it's not like the police. Like, what do you mean by topicality? Like, to, like whether caves are topical or? Uh, I'm assuming that topicality is an argument in which you are reading definitions of resolutional terms and presenting an interpretation of the division of affirmative and negative ground that limits affirmative ground to a particular set of starting points. That's what I mean by topicality. Are we, do I need to define any of those more precisely? Okay. So not like the police, why not? Did. I mean, like when you're like blending in here, like you just feel like they do the video, you feel like they do the sort of speech time. They do, there has to be like one limit where. When you join our society, you implicitly agree to the rules and laws that govern that society and it has to be policed by them. Kind of different, like if you want to start a space for like to express your like identity, you know, you could go in like a book public type thing. You could have like some type of debate for it. I don't know if I'm loving the sound of this as the not police when you're like, eh, whatever, like go, go be in a book club. Get out. Like I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not loving that. <laughs> don't get me wrong. Like I, we, I think we will get to some arguments about competition. Okay. Sid, like, I don't think that your argument has nothing to it, but like, 
Do you see if that's the place that we're leaping first in trying to break this analogy? It's just like, eh, like you came to debate voluntarily, like if you're upset about it, book club instead. Yeah. Starting to sound like maybe there's a point to some of these uh, substantive arguments about exclusion. Peter. It's like education to be one. How so? Like it's more a matter of like what did you get out of the debate, not about like whether you personally it's not like in the format of the debate. The results and the purpose are really different from law enforcement, right? Like limitation as in the sense of we are trying to enable debate pretty different than we are telling you what you cannot do okay so part of what you're saying here is that if this is about the division of affirmative and negative ground okay it does not preclude raising the argument or research, right? Like in the circumstance where you are talking about the police enforcing a law, a particular outcome is mandated, right? Like here, you you did this, this you're you know you're getting arrested, you're going to jail, whatever. Okay. In this circumstance, where we are dividing affirmative and negative ground, we aren't even saying right. There are certain ideas that are out of bounds. Okay. We are saying where they appear in the debate is different. Like the arguments that could be made on the app, okay, if they are not limited, right? Another place that they can be made is the negative, right? That we are not saying the set of ideas that you have presented, the arguments that you are making are not worthy of research or shouldn't be expressed. Okay, they may appear in that way. So, so we're saying that the should go on the negative side of the app. Well, uh, like uh, these arguments. Okay, you see the sentence that you're given there is one that's fairly common. Do it on the negative. Okay, I'm trying to get us to explain or build out this set of concepts a little bit more thoroughly. So, like you know, Sid's complaint that it's like. Yeah, this argument's on our blocks, but like so far we're, you know, at one argument from Deirdre about how to justify, right? We're like not very deep on this. So part of the way in which you need to make this set of arguments is to sound like you have thought about them and given an account of why you believe that you want to participate in a debate that has that set of procedural limitations, okay? This is a set of arguments that is most vulnerable to sounding a lot like a debate robot, okay? Like, this set of arguments has been going on for, you know, roughly like 15 to 17 years, maybe 20. Okay. It, it coincides almost exactly actually with the beginning of my debate career in college. Okay. The like first set of affirmatives that did not read plans that criticized the basis for the topic appeared in the early 2000s in college. Okay. And one of the things that you want to be thinking about is that means that there's like 20 years worth of making these arguments in particular ways, using the same set of phrases, et cetera, the blocks that you maybe, you know, some of which you've written, some of which are like sitting in a computer somewhere that you got from somebody else. Is that a fair characterization? Yeah. Okay. If you have not thought about debate and attempted to explain and express in your own terms some of what is at stake in the set of procedures, the chances that you will sound persuasive or compelling doing that are very low. Okay. Like, it's the circumstance where you, when I say debate robot, it's just the like, well, I could sub in somebody else and they might sound exactly the same because they'd be reading exactly the same set of blocks. So thinking about this set of arguments, writing them out on your own, trying to refine or hone them so that they sound like they're in your voice is an important tool here because otherwise there's a pretty good chance that your judge is willing to tune you out because you're not doing very much to engage them. Okay. Brief aside. <laughs> so. Back to not the police, because we want more on this argument. But if you had it easier, this would be an alternative to exclude their comments on the subject. Sid, I'm sorry, I'm shaking my head because it's like you're, you see how I just, I like just gave this long thing. I'm like, let's not leap ahead to the terminology that's been given to us. Let's try and generate some of it. Okay. Topical version of the affirmative that you've shortened to the TVA acronym. We're, we're leaving ahead a few steps. Okay. 
just like who we are in terms of being a family. Like, what do you mean by that? Well, it's just not like we don't like think like what you're saying is like inherently bad. It's just that like I don't know. You like just depend like I don't know how to like phrase this. I guess but okay. um, like kind of like framing like isn't really bad. It's just like a discussion of like what should be in debate. Okay, so when you say should be in debate, I'm a little not like should be, but like okay. like I know how to explain it. Okay, let's keep brainstorming some of the language then. Like, how would you differentiate this set of activities? Yeah. Well, kind of back to what you were just saying about like the results and purpose of like three being different from like the results and purpose of like policing, like in a group of people that like engagement, like like reading too is like an effort to like create a model of debate that like allows us to engage with their scholarship. And if we say that like we can't engage with their scholarship like in a way that's productive, we're not trying to just like kind of go back to like that predetermined outcome. Where we don't have this predetermined outcome where we're like you can't read this, you shouldn't engage with it. We're just seeking to find a model of debate that like allows us to engage in a way that like is valuable for both sides. Okay. So what if I, I'm going to maybe violate my own thing here on you all generating some of the terms, but I'm going to summarize your argument as that this topicality is an act of interpretation rather than enforcement. Yeah. What do I mean by this? Like, at, at, uh, remember this way, I won't presume or I, I don't think that we need to investigate too much whether or not any of you have ever had an encounter with the police or security in, you know, institution in our society, like maybe your school officer or whatever. But one of the things that I'm going to venture is that, like, you probably understand that arguing with the police, it's not really, uh, not really part of the game, right? Like, if I get pulled over for a speeding ticket, am I going to argue about like, you know, well, I really think the speed limit here ought to be 72 miles an hour. So like, Here's my set of arguments about why it would be safe for me to drive 72 miles an hour. It's not raining, like we're on the road. I, I feel relatively safe. I'm a really good driver. Like I've actually practiced driving at 72 miles an hour all the time, okay? What is the chance of success in my argument with the police? Zero, <laughs> literally zero, right? Like there is just, there is no room for argument. There is no room for interpretation. That's what I mean when I'm summarizing Part of Layla's argument as interpretation is not the same thing as enforcement, right? It is not a presumption that we already know exactly what we want or exactly the outcome that is, you know, legally authorized. Okay. That is, they, even with topicality, is a space for argument, right? We are arguing over how to interpret the resolution and the effects that that has rather than leaping to the conclusion that we already know for sure exactly what it meant, right? Like that's part of the reason that you're presenting definitions as support for an interpretation of the topic, rather than saying, you know, this is the only way in which one could ever interpret these words, or you don't get to argue with me. I establish the bounds of the topic that is beyond argument, right? Think about it this way. No one appeals to the judge as like, well, we all know that topicality is a law. so. Like this actually goes back to the back in the 50s or 60s when topicality was not really read as a matter of competing interpretations, but was treated as this like it, you gotta understand in the very, very early days of debate, like topicality was this all or nothing issue. And in some local circuits, actually, topicality, you could raise topicality and then demur, the app could demur and just say, the debate's over now. The judge is just gonna side, decide whether or not we're topical. <laughs> I, I raised that analogy just to point out that that's not the way that we think about topicality when you think of it as a matter of competing interpretation. We are not asking the judge just like immediate hearing, Your Honor, just like immediate ruling, out of bounds or in bounds, right? We are instead engaging in the process of argument and interpretation, right, that differentiates us from the notion of pure enforcement that is distinct from the police. Anybody persuaded by this analogy? By this, like, this is not. We're, we're getting closer to it is not the same activity but by like in topicality like uh aren't you like by saying topicality stuff aren't you demanding enforcement so 
I think that what you want to say there, and, and yes, the like, is enforcement implicit in interpretation, right? Well, is there the possibility of revision of interpretation? Like, is it set in stone? No. Does your opponent get a chance to revisit your interpretation? Yeah. Okay. So if we say that our interpretation is ongoing and that our procedure, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use a fancy term here, okay? Our procedure is reflexive. That is, it's a procedure that looks back on itself. We have the opportunity to continue to argue about this. Like argument doesn't stop after one debate. We don't go to the opening term and say, here's the interpretation of the topic. Well, now that uh, you know these five teams won that T argument, so well, I guess we just all agree and that's the topic now, right? We don't do that. Now, sometimes we <laughs> sometimes we have something that looks a little bit like that effect, right? Where it's just like, oh. It turns out we think that argument's pretty good, or like the cards that support that interpretation, they are very difficult to answer. Like, I'm not saying that at all times everything is automatically you are equally likely to win all the arguments, only that at, at all times they could be revisited, right? Debate teaches you to reflect on the process of interpretation itself. That's what reflexive means there is like, okay, it's a debate about debate. The debatability of topicality is one of its strengths. Right, it is distinct from the appeal to enforcement without interpretation. Right, that is, no one is acting as the officer who is authorized, the only authorized situation. Okay, both parties are authorized to interpret, both sides get the chance to argue over this interpretation. It isn't an asymmetrical relationship between the officer, right, who has legal authority and the citizen who does not. They only they have some legal protections, right, but they don't have authority in terms of how to interpret or enforce the law. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about this uh, competition part that, that Sid raised. So Implied by this account of substantive fairness, that is equality and outcome, is another way of thinking about that, right? That we are that we get equal outcomes. Okay. Implied by that, what would equal outcomes look like in some of these circumstances? Yes. Um, I guess that there's no the debate is like a, like a safe space and stuff for minorities, I guess, um, and that there's equality in like everyone, sort of, regardless of their identity, can get the same results in debate. Okay, so you, you, one of the ways that you're phrasing that is the same results are possible. Right? So like, that is an argument actually that is historically associated with the language here. And this, I'm not suggesting that this language is unproblematic. We'll try and unpack it or defend it. Sometimes these arguments are phrased in terms of the quality of opportunity rather than outcome, right? That it's like you get the same chance to get the outcome, okay? Even if you don't necessarily get the same outcome, there's some chance that you could have gotten there, okay? Notice, okay, the language of equality of opportunity in our society is oftentimes criticized for the same reasons that a number of the kind of policing style, you know, procedural positions that we just went into get criticized too, right? So like this language is associated with freedom in the marketplace, for example, right? Or like either a marketplace of ideas or a marketplace in the sense of like a market economy. And it comes in for many of the same criticisms, right? But like you don't start with the same stuff. <laughs> So the chances that you actually have equality of opportunity are very low. It's pure illusion, okay? I think that one of the ways that we might begin to defend this language, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna speed up a little bit since we're close to time. I, I, I like that we've gotten the number of contributions. I wanna kind of get in a few points at the end here first. One of the ways to defend the notion of equality of opportunity 
is to lower the stakes a little bit, okay? I think that you want to say that the equality of opportunity in winning or losing a particular debate is very different from the criticisms that might be levied against the quality of opportunity in say, getting the ability to like house yourself or feed yourself. The criticisms that we have of the marketplace when it is you know, governing people's basic substantive needs, I think it is reasonable to say that those are a little bit different than when we're talking about the outcome of, a, of an individual debate. Right, that we are not, oftentimes people take the opposite tack. They're like, because we want to defend the importance of debate. And like, I, I love debate. I think debate is awesome. I've made it my career and my profession. I love teaching about debate with all of you. Okay. But I think lowering the stakes rather than raising them is sometimes a good idea here. Okay. Sometimes people read cards. It's like it's very common in a set of debates for people to read cards that say, Students learning to debate about XYZ topic, okay, has potentially huge implications, okay? If you think about it back on, when you all were novices, some of you were novices on the criminal justice topic, is that right? Okay, some of you are maybe novices on uh, the water topic, right? In both of these cases, you could find cards that said like, students debating these issues, it's real, like everybody needs to know about water policy. The stakes of water policy are incredibly high. Everybody needs to know about criminal justice reform. The stakes of criminal justice reform are incredibly high. Yeah? I think that that is a model that defends debate too much on this like outcome argument, right? That it's like, what you're really saying there is having students draw the right conclusions about water policy has potentially huge implications, okay? And the T is really much more about process than it is about conclusions. If we're trying to make any of these arguments about how we don't presume a particular conclusion. Like, we don't know whether or not we should increase security cooperation with NATO. That we want the AF and the NED, we want the sides that are supporting that or refuting it to have equal opportunity. Like, could be a good idea, could be a bad idea. Reading evidence that suggests that what is important is the outcome for how you learn really cuts against the focus that I think is at the core of topicality, which is about process, right? If you're trying to make the argument that having different options appear on both the AF and the NEG is good. You don't really want to say that there are incredibly high stakes to reaching particular conclusions about a certain policy area. Does that make sense? Like you don't want to say, hey, since we know it is really good for the government to endorse security cooperation with NATO, it's like really, really good to have people debate that on the AF. Because what does that imply? It says that what we're doing is trying to reach the, the because we know the conclusion, right? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to rephrase some of your argument, but I think that you're right on, which is that because we know the conclusion, that means that we know that it's good to be affirmative, right? Like, hey, it's a great idea to do security cooperation. Like, the affirmative should do it. That implies that then, what is the negative arguing in that circumstance? Something that's really dumb and destructive and unproductive. It's just like, hey, we know that it's a great idea for people to, you know, engage in debates about security cooperation because, you know, these are going to be the people who are the future leaders in our national security apparatus. And like, we need to have great foreign policy decision making. Like, that means that you've already made a number of substantive conclusions about the topic. Any of the criticisms that you're saying would be great to read on the neg that national security is bunk, we should not securitize our world, that you know, NATO is a capitalist institution that exploits people, like any of those arguments, then when you're saying at the same time, like, hey, read this set of arguments on the neg, it'll be great. And at the same time, you're trying to go for actually, we already know that one side of the resolution is right. Those those two arguments, there is inherent tension there. Okay. If you are defending a process-based version of topicality of fairness, what you are looking for is not the conclusion, but the process, how you go about it, okay? Another way of explaining this, okay, or trying to justify it to you is, I've coached now on 
Oh boy, almost 20 topics in both high school and college. Okay. I don't categorize those topics by virtue of like, well, you know, it was like really important for me to learn about treaties. So like that's number one. And water policy, like, eh, it was boring. I didn't need to learn about that. It's number 20. Okay. Topics do, do vary in terms of strategic quality. Like sometimes they're written well or written poorly for getting some of the like the F and the neg each have good opportunities to win. Okay. But if we think about this as what debate has really taught me is that given any topic, I'm going to know how to start researching. I'm going to know that I need to consider a lot of different perspectives. I'm going to go to a bunch of different spots in the library. Like I think that topicality is a core tool of interdisciplinarity. I don't think that topicality is a form of gatekeeping. If I'm at all smart about my research, I'm going to all the different spots in the library because I need all the different arguments on both sides. Like, I'm not gatekeeping so that I'm only reading, like, if I went to, if I saw this topic and I was like, well, I'm going to go to the Hoover Institution or the Brookings Institute, the Rand Corporation, NATO's policy arm, uh, I'm going to read foreign affairs and foreign policy, I'm done. I'm ready to go, okay? I, like both from the strategic perspective of what debate teaches us to do, which is to maximize the number of arguments that we might be able to make, and from the perspective of like, I need to know a number of different arguments in order to be able to respond to them, I'm, I'm undermining my own chances. Like debate under this interpretation encourages us to go out and find all of this different stuff. That's part of the language that you were using about debate as interpretation enables more debate. It doesn't shut it down, okay? Like, Anybody who thinks that, you know, if you, the app is limited to reading a topical plan means that you shouldn't be going to do research on a whole bunch of different stuff. But I, I don't even understand, like that person strategically is at a huge disadvantage, okay? One of the other things that we might think about here is an argument that I rarely see made, but that I think is fairly important when people talk about structural unfairness or structural injustice, this whole competition thing, like, yes, we might want these as social outcomes, right? In terms of running a debate tournament, I don't really want equality of outcome. Why not? So in, instead of phrasing that as have to win, right? Because it's like, we could design debate that doesn't involve winning and losing, right? <laughs> Okay, why? Uh, because it's sort of like the grand like, purpose of debate for both sides is to run and develop arguments which enable you to beat an opponent and to demonstrate how all the argumentation and things like that, if there's no winner, then there's no value in like, doing that, I guess. So if I show up and I lose all my debates, does that mean that there's no value in my participation in debate? No, because your strategy, the things you developed to win may not have worked out, but that still doesn't mean that you didn't put in the value and you get the value from developing things rather than winning strategies and stuff like that. So if that's not connected to the value at all, then why do I need to lose? I mean, I guess. <laughs> Max is like, but it's a. Uh, are you okay with tag team cross sex? Uh, Layla will be here to leave this question. <laughs> like, I guess, like, if you like, even if like you lost and like you still get value, the reason why you invested all of the work that led you to losing is because you thought that there was a chance that you could win in like a way. Like, the reason why you did all of that research and like what spent like however many hours of your time at like some tournament was because you there was an incentive that you could win. And even if it's not successful, it doesn't mean that the incentive wasn't present. So is there a way to phrase that kind of in this terminology of like reflexivity? Yeah, because like, I guess like the, like the incentive is like to win, but like the way that you get there or don't get there is flexible. Like you don't have to win to get value out of debate, but like that is what people are seeking. An analogy here, I love pickup basketball, okay? I'm, I'm not making it to the NBA. 
my like, you know, 40 year old training. The, the, the cap, there's, there's a cap on, on my likely, uh, likely success in this area. Okay. But I definitely enjoy learning more about getting better at basketball or doing something well, even like, even as my crumbling body over the next few years means that I'm going to get like owned in the post or whatever. Like maybe I learn how to become a better passer, right? Trying to describe competition, Max, I think that you were in decent shape until you started describing competition so much in terms of just like, it's how it is, okay? Like, if you think about the way that people usually defend this like marketplace idea, okay, a bunch of the like conservative politicians in our society were just like, well, you know, it's a dog eat dog world out there. Like you gotta just, it's all competitive. So you gotta deal with it and just like pull yourself up by your bootstraps, okay? You can probably tell from my tone what I think of that argument. But in a context where we've sort of limited the stakes, right, but maximize the degree to which the process is helping us no matter whether or not we win or lose, competition, like when you described it as an incentive or just like that it isn't necessarily the, the winning and losing isn't the end thing, but it is a motivating factor in helping us improve and helping us learn more, right? It's the reverse of this argument that all that matters for us is to learn a particular set of things, not the process for how we get there. We want to be making the opposite argument that the process for how we get there is probably more important than some of the particular conclusions that we draw, right? Like, I think almost, almost every debater that I've talked to, you know, after they age out of the activity, right, they go on to do some other things, they graduate from college, whatever, it is very, very common to hear people reflect on debate as like the things that it taught me had less to do with some particular thing that I learned. And I learned a lot, but like what I really learned was how to learn, right? Like chances are, I, I hope that some of what you feel when you are in a classroom or when you're in another environment with people who are not doing debate, that one of the things that kind of helps differentiate what debate has helped you learn and helped you do is that, you know, we label it critical thinking a lot, right? Or just like learning how to learn. That's a, it's a big deal because we're gonna to need to learn in basically any environment and all things and all activities. And so if our process is pretty good for doing that, then maybe that's more important than learning some particular thing or some particular outcome. And in fact, like lots of the particular things that we learn over time turn out to be wrong. Right? Like if, if, if debate's value were determined by like a conclusion that I drew in 2004 about some aspect of our world, that's honestly kind of a sad account of debate. Like we hope that it's the gift that keeps on giving, not the one that only gives a particular outcome or a particular result, okay? Um, one last kind of thing that I wanted to talk a little bit about in terms of this like substantive versus procedure stuff. And then I'll take a couple of questions and then finally let you go to lunch. Anybody who doesn't want to go, go for questions can go to lunch because right? I understand you got to have time to eat. Okay. Opportunity here. You notice how these are arguments that are attached to particular people or a particular situation. What we're doing with topicality is really more about the role that somebody plays in a debate as the affirmative or the negative rather than the person that they are arguing on the affirmative or the negative. That is, we are not necessarily going to be able to deal with a situation where what we are giving is exactly equal inputs to begin with in terms of who you are, right? Same thing that I would draw with any of those lower stakes competitive analogies of like, you know, when I, when I go on my pickup basketball team, like, yeah, I want the chance to win. I don't want all of the people who are worse at basketball to all be on one team. But like, I also understand that what I'm bringing to the team is somehow limited, right? Or just like, I'm not, I'm not showing up as Jordan on the court, okay? But I want to make sure that both of those teams are playing by the same rules, right? But it's like, we are participating in the same activity. So this set of procedures is about the role of affirmative and negative, not person who is on the affirmative or person who is on the negative. Like, if you're more experienced in debate, you probably enjoy a greater opportunity to win, right? None of you mentioned that because you generally think of it probably as unobjectionable, right? If you're better practiced than the fact that 
you have a better chance to win, that you've learned more about debate, that you've gotten better at it. That's part of the premise of you being here at camp, right? It's just like, I want more experience. I want more time. I want to be able to do this better. We didn't list that as objectionable, but it clearly fits in the same category of just like, it's an input that is random, right? Some of you are going into 10th grade. Some of you are going into 12th grade. Like that's, that is not a, not a thing that is about you. That is a thing that is about your particular circumstance at that time. And you being affirmative or negative, right? Is pretty different than what we are talking about is trying to establish fairness between like Darwin and Max, absolutely in each debate that you have, right? If you want a kind of like a way of getting at some of this argument or just like one of the things to, to think about for some of this equality of opportunity, equality of outcome stuff, any of you ever read the story of Harrison Bergeron? Do you know Kurt Vonnegut? Oh, yeah. Kurt Vonnegut's Harrison Bergeron. Look it up, take a read. Just interesting philosophical little short story on this set of stuff. Oh, wait, Kurt. Waterhouse wait. Five? Wait, wasn't there something about like 50? I need to look it up. Okay. Slaughterhouse Five is oh, yeah, Slaughterhouse Five is the novel that most often gets read in school by Von. But Harrison Bergeron is a short story of his that kind of deals with this like equality of opportunity stuff. It's pretty interesting. Okay, if you don't want to stay for Q and A, totally understood. I will not take offense if you want to go to lunch. If you want to stay for some Q and A, I'm happy to stay and answer some questions. I have a question. Yeah. Do you think that in the uh, that there is like a biopower argument to be made that, and, and if you made this, such an argument, would it fall under the lower stakes category? Like police and border patrol actually have power over people's bodies or does it kind of give them the analogy yeah. um, and it's a sort of like crappy impact mitigation? I, I mean, I think that the part of the reason that it was like, oh, I wouldn't start there is just like, it's not that I don't think that that's worthy of mentioning. Like, I do think that it fits in the lowered stakes that the outcome of a debate is not the same as like you do or do not get entry to the country. Um, but I think that rather than only mitigating the impact, the thing that we first want to do is to kind of say just like, no, 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 no. <laughs> What's happening is very different. Then the, like, it's the same reason that impact defense in general is a category that's like, it's not at the top of our blocks for a reason, right? It's like generally not the most powerful category of argument, but I think it is, it's like, it's perfectly reasonable to make that argument, right? It's just like, yes, the stakes of the encounter are lower, right? I think if I were, if I were on the other side of this argument, I would try and make the claim about how all of that stuff is interlinked, that like we learn to internalize some of these ideologies about competition and opportunity in a way that makes us accept those things in higher stakes situations. So like we learn to participate in a marketplace of ideas because that teaches us to that a marketplace society is good. I guess one of the reasons that I'm not persuaded by that argument is that no, like if you think about kind of the substantive political opinions associated with people in debate, I think that it's hardly a set of people who tend to towards the reactionary defense of just like all that matters is competition in a dog eat dog world. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not wholly satisfied with that answer or wholly satisfied with that argument, but just like, I don't think that the, it teaches us to participate in a marketplace stuff is that great considering that in, com like in comparison to your regular school, do you agree that debate tends to expose you to a set of ideas that otherwise wouldn't show up? <laughs> Chances are you're going to learn a fair more about socialism or anti-blackness in debate than you are in your school, right? Like your textbook is not going to include quotes from Frank Wilderson. You are not going to read Foucault in high school. Yeah. So that's part of the reason that I think the like it implicitly is teaching us to embrace a number of these other things. I think is it's like that's kind of the assumption that we are drawing very specific conclusions out of debate as opposed to learning a process that teaches us a bunch of different stuff. I know that's not directly related to your question, but kind of, no, I, I think. I mean, I think I can't be the Margaret Thatcher of debate to be like, there's no alternative. <laughs> there are lots of alternatives. Yeah. And everyone's going to point that out immediately. Yeah, right. It does not, it doesn't tend to be the place where it's just like, oh yeah, a bunch of people who just accept an argument without any justification, like 
not 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 characteristic of the debate community. Sometimes maybe too much the other way. Um, this was like really process focused. How do you answer if like there is like that process? Even if you think that like the process is more important, like if we learn that that process leads to like this like bad type of education that has these bad results, like that means we should also reject the process as well. Well, what do you mean bad education? Like education that falls within like these like like structural issues, like that education that like is like maybe black or like uh -huh. or like normative. So, for instance, like if we win the argument that NATO is a capitalist institution and capitalism is exploitative, then why would we ever want to learn that NATO could be good? Is that what you're saying? Um, yeah, I think so. Okay, I kind of put that in the process. Like, I think that's actually part of the thing for process is like, how do we know which side of the argument is right? Well, we have a set of procedures that are really good at teaching us to learn about whether or not arguments are right or wrong, good or bad, where they where they take us, productive, unproductive, like whatever language you want to use there. I probably wouldn't use true or false or good or bad. I'd say something like productive, unproductive, or you know, language that really says that we're not reaching a final truth. Okay. One of the the cards that I never showed you, because like eh, reading cards in this area oftentimes is not particularly helpful anyway, but just like the cards that defend the culture of argument almost always tend towards the like some version of that our epistemology right how we know things how we judge the criteria for what is valid knowledge that's the epistemology is the study of the production of valid knowledge okay or what is that the epistemic criteria or like what is valid knowledge that argument as an epistemic tool okay presumes that all things are subject to evaluation or further argument right it, it is that reflex that's part of where i'm getting that reflexivity like i tend to love some of the like if you remember way back in the opening session where i threatened to like start talking about john dewey for like 10 minutes in the in the opening session that's for, like i love the american pragmatists in part because they're pretty good on like we are trying to, to have a process that is about small t truths so like provisional truths never final capital t truth and i think debate is a really good way of reflecting the like it, another phrase that gets into like it turtles all the way down we're not building some foundation where it's like here's the good education okay i think that that's pretty vulnerable to like one of the examples that doesn't get cited here is just like in most in lots of other circumstances in our society if someone started using the language of like good education bad education we oftentimes would be kind of nervous about that like if you think about all the stuff about book banning, censorship, right? The like people need to learn the truth. A number of our most authoritarian impulses in our society and the authoritarian impulses in other societies have tended towards the like, well, if we just explain to people from a very, very young age exactly what is right, then we never have to worry about the bad ideas or influences that they might get from somewhere else. So that's why I get a little bit skeptical about the language of good and bad education. If something teaches me, if the process teaches me to reflect at all times on what I think that I know, I have some, maybe misplaced, but I have some confidence that that's better than starting from the position that I knew what was right from the beginning. The ideas that I am, that I feel the best about in terms of like things that I, values and principles that I'm committed to, some ideas that are, you know, kind of core to who I am, those are the ideas where I feel like I've learned the most from like that I have the best capacity to answer other people's arguments who disagree with me. If I didn't know their arguments, I that's usually a place where I, I think reasonably, I should feel some self doubt about what I like. Just sorry, this may be a very boring personal anecdote. Okay, but just I, I would describe myself as a, you know, socialist, or like a moderate socialist economically. A pro, you know, like I definitely was convinced on some of the capitalism bad arguments back in college when I was like 20. I know a lot more about some of mainstream economic thinking and the way in which economics is organized as a discipline as an actual debate after many, many years of reading about it than I did at the time. Like I feel better about that conclusion because I know more about the other side's arguments, not because I just sat there memorizing Marx. Like I don't love that concept. So that's, you know, 
I use the personal analogy there, not necessarily because it's obviously not something that you want to put in your blocks, but like chances are that you can describe that in terms in some personal terms for yourself, just like why it is that this people discuss this in that using the abstract language of testing, right? Which is like that's part of the debate robot language. It's just like rigorous testing, testing good, iterated argument, you know, like they repeat that set of phrases. Try and add to that with something that's like got a little bit of <laughs> a little bit of grab or like engagement. So that's why I was trying to do that part. I don't know if it works. Other questions? I was just a little confused about the lower stakes part. Um, so I think you mean uh, like when it's the bay is unfair and has lower stakes, is that what? I think that you want to lower the stakes of the result of the outcome of any particular debate. Rather than read these cards that are like, Debate helps us solve existential threats. Or like the like the more that you raise the stakes, the more that I think that you're kind of in this territory of like what we are designing is synonymous with the society itself, as opposed to an institution that helps us reflect on and question that society. Does that make sense? Like you just too many of those arguments that say like it's really, really important to debate this set of ideas on the app, the like content education style cards that people read. They're, they're too close to this, to like what matters is the conclusions that we draw, not the process that we're engaged in. So that's what I mean by kind of lowering the stakes. It's like, instead of saying, we know which conclusions to reach, we want to talk a lot more about the process for reaching any conclusion. Okay, let's get you to lunch because <laughs> it's, it's 12.15, but thank you for staying a little bit of extra time.